Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we continue with the Baltic Quick Missions. I was um, revealing uh, my videos and realized there were a handful of aircraft we missed. It turns out we double dipped on the SU-35, although in this campaign it appears in a significantly different context than in the Ukraine campaign where it was like some sort of semi-stealth attack aircraft, but in any case... Uh, let's set up our theater here. Today we will be playing the, or showcasing rather, the Tornado. The, I don't know if it's pronounced Panavia or Panavia, but um, it's a twin engine variable sweep multi-role combat aircraft that uh, was kind of like, in some respects, the first Eurofighter really. And uh, it's pretty comparable to the F-111, because there's three variants. There's the interdiction variant, which is comparable to, you know, your baseline F-111. There's an electronic warfare variant that's somewhat comparable to the EF-111 Raven. And then there's an air defense variant that's comparable to the uh, canceled F-111D program. So, today I think we will be doing the Brits. Um, let's see here. Probably has some Eurofighters covering for us, since uh, this game only models the um, the interdiction variant of the Tornado. Uh, tactically, you have your uh, Tornado IDS, which is what we are, which is interdiction strike. Uh, the Seed Tornado is the Tornado ECR, Electronic Combat and Reconnaissance, and then ADV is the Air Defense Variant, and that's their air defense oh, variant. <laughs> um, let's see here. Do, 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 your fighters, there we go. Let's start off eh, 10 miles from enemy forces. That'll put the... Uh, Hee-haw, hee-haw. Um, all right, let's start off 20 miles. There we go, we'll have three three wings of three aircraft for the Russians. Uh, let's give them MiG-29Ms, SC-27s. And then, let's say, some MiG-31s. So we'll be taking a custom weapons load and uh hmm. let's go for a forward airfield that sounds like fun okay so we see we have the standard bk27 mauser cannon here uh two 250 gallon tanks that's fine as far as uh, i think what I'll do here is, ooh, we can get 14 500 pound bombs there. Okay, so well, let's see what happens if I get a three pack. Here we go. Uh, it's only 12, so that's also 12. So that maximizes our, uh, the, just the amount of ordnance we can carry. And then we could go for some, uh... oh, look at that big beefy boy. BBB, big beefy boy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there is, we could carry a pair of CBU 97B, which I'm actually curious now, so I'm gonna look it up. CBU uh, 97 flash. Bravo. Maybe 97 sensor fused weapon. MBLU 108 sub munitions. Each sub munition contains four projectiles called skeets. These attack target vehicles such as tanks, armored personnel carriers, trucks, and other support vehicles, and fire explosively form penetrator down at them. Okay, so this is definitely like a uh, an anti-armor cluster munition kind of, or at least an anti-vehicle one, maybe not necessarily as effective against tanks given the 
small size of the charge, but pair that to the CBU. What is that? Well, that's CBU 97. Okay. So the CBU 97. <laughs> there's a there's a precision guided variant of a of the CBU 97 that's a CBU 105. It's like it's a precision and cluster bomb kind of contradictory. Uh, in any case, yeah, it's kind of the same thing except I think it has. Actually, it is the same thing. It still carry. It's got a different munition dispenser, but it still carries 10 BLU 108s. And each of those carries 4 skeets. So you still have 40 skeets. So. Oh, I'm actually kind of interested in what the. I mean, this one's heavier, obviously. So I don't know if it disperses it in a wider area, if it's just more accurate in terms of landing where you want it to land, but um, I think this will do us for our attack, so uh, with that, let's get started. Oops, misclicked there. There we go. Alright, so there's no need for us to go fast at the moment. We will let our hero fighter brethren uh, take this one for us. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they win. But I think we're going to, as bad as it's going to be, we might have to get involved in this uh, kerfluffle here. Missile launch! Missile launch! Missile launch! Here comes their wave of missiles. Actually raises the question. Do we have IR? No. That's unfortunate. Old formation, gentlemen. It looks like these guys are uh, starting to take some AMRAM fire. <laughs> nice. Alright, I think the Eurofighters got us covered, so. Attack Breaking the gauge. Missile uh, We might take some pot shots at this guy. Oh, there goes one of our wingmen. Ooh, two cannons. Okay, did not know that. I thought it just had a single cannon. Alright, so we got some air defenses here. Uh, hopefully they're close enough that... Uh, um, there must be some aircraft on the runway there. Hopefully they're close enough that our cluster munitions can uh, do something about that. And uh, they aren't quite hitting, are they? Okay, yeah, they're just Heinz, fortunately. We'll fire one cluster munition, and then... We got, uh... All these bombs here, so... Ooh, there goes the cluster munitions. And here comes the bombs. Wow, that sound is, uh, not so great. So we will swing around for a second pass here. It must have... Are they taking my loadout, or do they have the default loadout? And fuck you in particular. <laughs> and we 
should be seeing the end of, uh... That's ESC 23. Oh, it missed. Overshot it by a little bit. But had it hit, that would have been the end of that, uh, ESC 23. Oh, it looks like we did some damage to it, maybe. Uh... Alright. Let's even out. We took some damage. Hopefully nothing too severe. But, uh, I do want to impress upon my wingman that, uh... That there bunker is the primary target, so... Kinda wish we still had uh, another ZSC-23. Give some cover to our wingman here. Nice little intermission brought to us by 1990s computer code. Uh, there, it looks like our wingman is uh, oh, making his attack run there. Bomb released. Booyah! And that's the mission, so we're just going to clean up uh, the sand here, and then I think we'll head home. So everyone disengage. And this way, this guy is probably out of missiles by this point, but um, this keeps him from taking pot shots at, off, at us while we uh, get out of here. Tram launch. Tram launch. I say as a uh, fire missiles at us. All right, boys, let's get out of here. Oh. Let's see. We want to head 270. Which unfortunately is right over the, uh, the remains of their air defenses down there. So let's climb and uh, get some altitude. Let's see, we got. Looks like three wingmen still with us, so we've only lost uh, wingman number four. Oh, there goes wingman number two. That must be a ZSU-57 if we're still in his range. Alright, we're out of the range. I think we can ease down on the uh, throttle now, and it looks like we can, uh, at this point we can head straight south, and we'll hit up uh, Tartu Air Base there. So let's change to heading 180, and uh, we shall cruise on down south, switch to navigation mode switch to and then we can calm our engine a little bit there so the Pan of Via Tornado is a family of twin engine variable sweep wing multi-role combat aircraft as I mentioned previously which was a joint venture between Italy the United Kingdom and West Germany and like I've previously mentioned as well there's the three variants the interdictor variant the ECR electronic combat the rec reconnaissance variant and the ADV air defense variant now, it was developed and built by Panavia Aircraft GmbH, which was a tri-national consortium consisting of British Aerospace, formerly the British Aircraft Corporation, MBB of West Germany, and Air Italia of Italy. First flew on 14th of August, 1974, and was introduced into service in 1979 and 1980. Due to its multi-role design, it was able to replace several different fleets of aircraft in the adopting air forces. Royal Saudi Air Force became the only export operator of the Tornado in addition to the three original partner nations. 
Tri-Nation Training and Evaluation Unit operating from RAF Cotsmore, the Tri-National Tornado Training Establishment, maintained a level of international cooperation beyond the production stage. The tornado was operated by the Royal Air Force, Italian Air Force, and the Royal Saudi Air Force during the Gulf War of 1991, in which the tornado conducted many low-altitude penetrating strike missions. Tornadoes of various services were also used in the Bosnian War, the Kosovo War, the Iraq War, in Libya during certain stages of the Libyan Civil War, as well as smaller roles in Afghanistan, Yemen, and Syria. Across all variants, 990 aircraft were built. Which uh, is actually a decently large number, especially for Europe. So it has its origins in the 1960s when aeronautical engineers were looking to variable geometry wing designs to gain maneuverability and efficient cruise speed of straight wings with the high speed of swept wing designs. UK had cancelled its procurement of the TSR 2 and sub subsequent F 111K aircraft, but they are still looking for a replacement for their Avro Vulcan and Blackburn Buccaneer strike aircraft. Britain and France had initiated the BAC Dassault AFVG, Anglo-French Variable Geometry Project, in 1965, but this ended with the withdrawal of the French in 1967. Big shocker there. Britain continued to develop a variable geometry aircraft similar to the proposed AFVG and sought new partners to achieve this. West German e &R, EWR had been developing the swing wing EWR Fairchild Hiller A400 AVS Advanced Vertical Strike aircraft, which has actually a very similar configuration to the Tornado, at least uh, visually. And in 1968, West Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, and Canada formed a working group to re-examine replacements for the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, initially called the Multi-Role Aircraft, later renamed as the Multi-Role Combat Aircraft. As the partner nation's requirements were so diverse, it was decided to develop a single aircraft that could perform a variety of missions that were previously undertaken by a fleet of different aircraft. Britain joined the MRCA group in 1968, represented by Air Vice Marshal Michael Giddings, and a memor memorandum of agreement was drafted between Britain, West Germany, and Italy in May of 1969. <coughs> Excuse me. By the end of 1968, Prospective purchases from the six countries amounted to 1,500 aircraft. Canada and Belgium had departed before any long-term commitments had been made to the program, and Canada had found the project politically unpalatable. There was a perception of political circles that much of the manufacturing and specifications were focused on Western Europe. I mean, yeah, because it's mainly developed by Western European countries, but okay. But we are off course. All right. What we are about where we want to be. So let's swing around here. And there they are. Up, 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 up. And France um, had made a favorable offer to Belgium and the Salt Mirage 5, so that's why they dropped out of the project. Also, it's worth noting that the U.S. supplied Canada with Legacy Hornets in, probably shortly after we started making them in the 80s, and likewise we supplied Belgium with some F-16, so that probably further reduced their desire to participate on the project. So on the 26th of March 1969, the four partner nations at that time, the UK, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands, agreed to form a multinational company, Panavia, or Panavia Aircraft GmbH, to develop and manufacture the MRCA. The project's aim was to produce an aircraft capable of undertaking missions in the tactical strike, reconnaissance, air defense, and maritime roles. Various concepts, including alternative fixed wing and single engine designs, were studied while defining the aircraft. Netherlands pulled out of the project in 1970, citing that the aircraft was too complicated and technical for the Royal ne for the RNALF's preferences. I, I imagine. Oh, okay, I see. Royal Netherlands Air Force. I was like, what does the N stand for? But I think it's part of um, 
Netherlands. In any case, um, they sought a simpler aircraft with outstanding maneuverability, which I believe also ended up becoming the F-16. An additional blow was struck when the German requirement was reduced from an initial 600 aircraft to 324 in 1972. It has been suggested that Germany deliberately placed an unrealistically high initial order to secure the company headquarters and initial test flight in Germany rather than the UK so as to have a bigger design influence. When the agreement was finalized, the United Kingdom and West Germany each had a 42.5% stake of the workload, with the remaining 15% going to Italy. This division of the production work was heavily influenced by international political bargaining. Front fuselage and tail assembly was assigned to BAC, that's British Aircraft Corporation, I think, which is now Bay Systems in the United Kingdom, the center fuselage to MBB, now part of Airbus in West Germany, and the wings to Air, Air, Air Italia, <laughs> now uh, Leonardo, in Italy. Similarly, tri-national work sharing was used for engines and components. A separate multinational company, Turbo Union, was formed in June of 1970 to develop and build the RB199 engines for the aircraft with ownership split 40% Rolls-Rice, 40% MTU, and 20% Fiat. At the conclusion of the project definition phase in May of 1970, concepts were reduced to two designs, a single-seat Panavia 100, which West Germany initially preferred, and the twin-seat Panavia 200, which the RAF preferred. The aircraft was briefly called the Panavia Panther, and the project soon coalesced towards the two-seat option. In September 1971, the three governments signed an intention to proceed document, at which point the aircraft was intended solely for the low-level strike mission, where it was viewed as a viable threat to Soviet defenses in that role. It was at this point that Britain's chief of the defense staff announced two-thirds of the fighting front line will be composed of this single basic aircraft. Prototypes and testing. The first of 15 development aircraft, uh, nine prototypes, P01 through P09 and 6 pre series, PS11 through PS16, flew on the 14th of August 1974 at Manching, Germany. The pilot, Paul Millet, described his experience. Aircraft handling was delightful. The actual flight went so smoothly that I did begin to wonder whether this was not yet another simulation. Flight testing led to the need for minor modifications. Airflow disturbances were responded to by by reprofiling the engine intakes and the fuselage to minimize surging and buffeting experienced at supersonic speeds. Alright, let's uh, line up for our landing here. And we have clearance to land, excellent. According to Jim Quinn, programmer of the Tornado Development simulation software and engineer on the tornado engine and engine controls, the prototype was safely capable of reaching supercruise, but the engines had severe safety issues at high altitude while trying to decelerate. At high altitude and low turbine speed, the compressor did not provide enough pressure to hold back the combustion pressure and would result in a violent vibration as the combustion pressure backfired into the intake, which sounds rather unpleasant. To avoid this effect, the engine controls will automatically increase the minimum idle setting as altitude increased. Still at very high altitudes, the idle setting was so high, it was high however, that it was close to maximum dry thrust. And we need to do some deceleration ourselves here. We are coming in way too high. And that's more like it. There we go. Let's bring us down to a more reasonable, uh, eh, maybe 50 knots. That's 70 will do for now. This resulted, however, in one of the test aircraft being stuck in a Mach 1.2 supercruise at high altitude and having to reduce speed by turning the aircraft because the idle setting at that altitude was so high the air that the aircraft would not decelerate. That's certainly uh, 
Not exactly what you want to happen. The British Ministry of Supply ordered Chief Engineer Ted Talbot from the Concord Development Team to provide intake design assistance to the Tornado Development Team in order to overcome these issues, which they hesitantly agreed to after knowing that the Concord intake data had apparently already been leaked to the Soviet Union. The German engineers working on the Tornado intake were unable to produce a functional Concord-style intake despite having data from the Concord team. To make the problem worse, their management team incorrectly filed a patent on the Concorde design and then tried to sue the British engineers who had provided the design to them. Wow, that's... that's some bullshit right there. Like, that's something I would expect from an American corporation, almost, especially, uh... especially our defense corporations. Uh, we are idling when I don't want to be. There we go. The German lawyers realized that the British had provided the designs to the German team and requested further information to help their engineers overcome the problems with the tornado intake, but Chief Engineer Talbot refused. According to Talbot, the Concorde engineers had determined the issue with the tornado intake was that the engine did not respond to unexpected changes in intake position. Therefore, the engine was running at the wrong setting for a given position of the intake ramps. This was because the Concorde had similar issues due to control pressure not being high enough to maintain proper angles of the intake ramps. Aerodynamic forces could force the intakes into the improper position, and so they should have the ability to control the engines if this occurs. The tornado intake system did not allow for this, however. Due to the behavior of the German management team, the British engineers declined to share this information, and so the tornado was not equipped with the more advanced intake design in the Concorde. Testing revealed that a nose wheel steering augmentation system connecting with the yaw damper was necessary to counteract the destabilizing effect produced by deploying the thrust reverser during the landing point. Oh, that's why they have us decelerate so quickly on the runway, because they don't model a thrust re reverser in here. That's how they uh, <laughs> make these so short and why these aircraft can land on a dime, essentially. From 1967 until 1984, Soviet KGB agents were provided details on the tornado by the head of the Western German Messerschmitt Volkel Bohm Planning Department, Manfred Roch. Alright. Okay, we weren't going that fast. I thought we were only going like 40 knots. See, this is where a thrust reverser would be useful, because then I could turn back into this hardened aircraft shelter, but... Come on. Come on. There we go. Gotta overcome that static friction there. Moving something is always easier when it's already moving. I think that's close enough for government work here. So now we're just waiting for our uh, two other wingmen to land. And we're going to move to joystick so I don't do that. It looks like uh, wingmen are other wingmen's in the landing pattern right now. Two prototypes were lost in accidents, both of which had been primary primarily caused by poor piloting decisions and errors leading to two ground collision incidents. The third tornado prototype was seriously damaged by an incident involving pilot-induced pitch oscillation. During the type's development, aircraft designers of the era were beginning to incorporate features such as more sophisticated stability augmentation systems and autopilots. Aircraft such as the Tornado and the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon made use of these new technologies Failure testing of the Tornado's Triplex Analog Command and Stability Augmentation System 
was conducted on a series of realistic flight control rigs. Variable sweep wings in combination with varying and frequently very heavy payloads complicated the clearance processes. Now as far as the production goes, contract for the Batch 1 aircraft was signed on the 29th of July 1976. The first flight of production aircraft was on the 10th of July 1979. First aircraft were delivered to the RAF and German Air Force on the 5th and 6th of June 1979 respectively. The first Italian tornado was delivered on the 25th of September 1981. On the 29th of January 1981, the Tri-National Tornado Training Establishment officially opened at RAF Cotsmoor, remaining active in training pilots from all operating nations until the 31st of March 1999. The 500th tornado to be produced was delivered to West Germany on the 19th of December in 1987. Export customers were sought after West Germany withdrew its objections to exporting the aircraft. Saudi Arabia was the only export customer of the tornado, however, which I'm sure disappointed the Germans. They tend to be uh, somewhat strict in their exports, I believe, on the basis of human rights, of which Saudi Arabia is uh, a lot, not very good at, let's say. <laughs> The agreement to purchase the Tornado was part of the controversial Al Yama arms deal between British Aerospace and the Saudi government. Oman had committed to purchasing Tornadoes and the equipment to operate them for a total value of £250 million in the late 1980s, but cancelled the order in 1990 due to financial difficulties. During the 1970s, Australia considered joining the MRCA program to find a replacement for their aging Dassault Mirage 3s. Ultimately, the McDonnell Douglas F.A. 18 Hornet was selected to meet the requirement. Canada similarly opted for the F.A. 18 after considering the Tornado. Japan considered the Tornado in the 1980s along with the F-16 and F.A. 18 before selecting the Mitsubishi F-2, which if you've seen my video on that then you know that's basically their own license modification to the F-16. In the 1990s, both Taiwan and South Korea expressed interest in acquiring a small number of Tornado ECR aircraft. In 2001, EADS proposed a Tornado ECR variant with a greater electronic warfare capability for Australia. But uh, I think we all know that the, uh, I don't know what they use for their electronic warfare requirement in the interim, but as of now, Australia operates the Growler for its electronic warfare operations. Production came to an end in 1998, the last batch of aircraft produced going to the Royal Saudi Air Force who had ordered a total of 96 IDS tornadoes. In June of 2011, it was announced that the tornado fleet had flown collectively over 1 million flying hours. Aviation author John Lake noted that the Trinational Panavia Consortium produced just short of a thousand tornadoes, making it one of the most successful post-war bomber programs. In 2008, Air Force's monthly set of the Tornado for more than a quarter of a century the most important military aircraft in Western Europe. So, the Navia Tornado is a multi-role twin-engine aircraft designed to excel at low-level penetration of enemy defenses, similar to the SU-24 and F-111. Mission envisioned envisaged during the Cold War was the delivery of conventional and nuclear ordnance on the invading forces of the Warsaw Pact countries of Eastern Europe. This dictated several significant features of the design. Variable wing geometry allowed for minimal drag during the low-level dash towards a well-prepared enemy. Advanced navigation flight computers, including the then-innovative fly-by-wire system, greatly reduced the workload of the pilot during low-level flight and eased control of the aircraft. For long-range missions, the Tornado has a retractable feel refueling probe. As a multi-role aircraft, the Tornado is capable of undertaking more mission profiles than an the anticipated strike mission. Various operators replace multiple aircraft types with the Tornado as a common type. The use of a de dedicated single-role aircraft for specialist purposes such as battlefield reconnaissance, maritime patrol duties, or dedicated electronic countermeasures were phased out either by standard tornadoes or modified variants, such as the Tornado ECR. The most extensive modification from the base tornado design was the Tornado ADV, which was stretched and armed with long-range anti-aircraft missiles to serve in the interceptor role. Tornado operators have undertaken various life extension upgrade programs to keep their tornado fleets as viable frontline aircraft. With these upgrades, it is projected that the tornado shall be in service until 2025, more than 50 years after the first prototype took flight. Now, in order for the Tornado to perform well as a 
low-level supersonic strike aircraft, it was considered necessary for it to possess good high-speed and low-speed flight characteristics. To achieve high-speed performance, a swept or delta wing is typically adopted, but these wing designs are inefficient at low speeds. To operate at both high and low speeds with great effectiveness, the Tornado uses a variable sweep wing. This approach had been adopted by early aircraft such as the American General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark Strike Fighter and the Soviet Mikoyan Gorovich MiG-23 Fighter. The smaller Tornado has many similarities with the F-111, however, the Tornado differs in being a multi-role aircraft with more advanced onboard systems and avionics. The level of wing sweep can be altered in flight at the pilot's control. Variable wing can adopt any sweep angle between 25 degrees and 67 degrees, with the corresponding speed range for each angle. Some Tornado ADVs were outfitted with an automatic wing sweep system to reduce pilot workload. When the wings are swept back, the exposed wing area is lowered and drag is significantly decreased, which is conduct conducive to performing high speed, low level flight. The weapon's pylons pivot with the angle of the variable sweep wing so that the stores point in the direction of flight and do not hinder any wing positions. In development, significant attention was given to the Tornado's short field takeoff and landing performance. Germany in particular encouraged this design aspect, and this is because they envisioned a lot of air bases in uh, Central Europe uh, were going to be hit by, you know, artillery or aircraft or cruise missiles or what have you so they would have to fly from damaged air bases or roughly prepared forward air bases or even highway systems which uh, don't always allow you the uh, the uh, convenience of having a two kilometer long strip for takeoff and landing Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. For shorter takeoff and landing distances, the tornado can sweep its wings forwards to the 25 degree position and deploy its full span flap and leading edge slats to allow the aircraft to fly at slower speeds. These features, in combination with the thrust reverser equipped engines, give the tornado excellent low speed handling and landing characteristics. As far as avionics go, the Tornado features a tandem seat cockpit crewed by a pilot and a navigator and weapons officer. Both electromechanical and electro-optical controls are used to fly the aircraft and manage its systems. An array of dials and switches are mounted on either side of a centrally placed CRT monitor, controlling the navigational communications and weapons control computers. Base systems develop the Tornado Advanced Radar Display Information System, or TARDIS, a 32.5cm multifunction display to replace the rear cockpit's combined radar and projected map display. The ARAF began installing TARDIS on the GR4 fleet in 2004. The primary flight controls of the Tornado are a fly-by-wire hybrid consisting of an analog quadruplex command and stability augmentation system connected to a digital autopilot. And it looks like our other wing is taking off because they're going through that loop again. Connected to a digital autopilot flight director system. In addition, a level of mechanical reversion capability was retained to safeguard against potential failure. To enhance pilot awareness, artificial feel was built into the flight controls, such as the centrally located stick. Because of the tornado's variable wings, enabled the aircraft to drastically alter its flight envelope, the artificial responses adjust automatically to wing profile changes and other changes to flight altitude. As a large variety of munitions and stores can be outfitted, the resulting changes to the aircraft's flight dynamics are routinely compensated for by the flight stability system. The Tornado incorporates a combined navigation attack Doppler radar that simultaneously scans for targets and conducts fully automated terrain following for low flight level operations. Being able to conduct all weather hands off low level flight was considered one of the core advantages of the Tornado. The tornado ADV had a different radar system to the other variants designated AL24 Fox Hunter. At least I think that might be an L. L or an I, who knows, right? as it is designed for air defense operations. It was capable of tracking up to 20 targets at ranges of up to 160 kilometers. 
Tornado was one of the earliest aircraft to be fitted with a digital data bus for data transmission. Link 16 JTIDS integration on the F3 variant enabled the exchange of radar and other sensory information with nearby friendly aircraft. Some Tornado variants carry different avionics and equipment depending on their mission. Tornado ECR, operated by Germany and Italy, is devoted to the suppression of enemy air defenses missions. So the Tornado ECR is equipped with an emitter locator system to detect radar use. The German ECRs have a Honeywell infrared imaging system for reconnaissance flights, and Royal Air Force and Royal Saudi Air Force tornadoes have the laser rangefinder and marked target seekers for targeting laser guided munitions. In 1991, the RAF induced PLD, allowing Tornado GR1s to laser designate their own targets. The GR1A and GR4A reconnaissance variants were equipped with TURS, Tornado Infrared Reconnaissance System, consisting of one sideways looking infrared sensor on each side of the fuselage forward of the engine intakes to capture oblique images, and a single infrared line scan sensor mounted on the fuselage's underside to provide vertical images. TURS recorded images on six SVHS videotapes. The newer Raptor reconnaissance pod replaced the built in TURS system. As far as armament and equipment go, the Tornado is cleared to carry the majority of air launch weapons in the NATO inventory, including various unguided and laser guided bombs, anti ship and anti radiation missiles, as well as specialized weapons such as anti personnel mines and anti runway munitions. To improve survivability in combat, the Tornado is equipped with onboard countermeasures ranging from flare and shaft dispensers to electronic countermeasure pods that can be mounted under the wings. Underwing field tanks and a buddy store aerial refueling system that allows one tornado to refuel another are available to extend the aircraft's range. In the decades since the tornado's introduction, all of the tornado operators have undertaken various upgrade and modification programs to allow new weapons to be used by their squadrons. Amongst the armaments that the tornado has been adopted to deploy are the enhanced payway and joint direct attack munition bombs and modern cruise missiles such as the Taurus and Storm Shadow missiles. These upgrades have increased the Tornado's capabilities and combat accuracy. Precision weapons such as cruise missiles have replaced older munitions such as cluster bombs. Strike variants have a limited air-to-air -air capability with AIM-9 Sidewinder or AIM-132 ASRAM air-to-air -air missiles. The Tornado ADV was outfitted with beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles such as the Skyflash and AIM-120 AMRAM missiles. The Tornado is armed with two 27mm Mauser BK-27 revolver cannons internally mounted underneath the fuselage. Tornado ADV was armed with only one cannon. When the RAF GR-1 aircraft was con were converted back to GR-4, or converted to GR-4, the FLIR sensor replaced the left-hand cannon, leaving only one. The GR-1A reconnaissance variant gave up both its guns to make space for the sideways-looking infrared sensors. The Mauser BK-27 was developed specifically for the Tornado, but has since been used on other European fighters, such as the Dassault Dornier Alpha Jet, the Saab JAS-39 Gripen, and the Eurofighter Typhoon. The Tornado was capable of delivering air-launched nuclear weapons. In 1979, Britain considered replacing its Polaris submarines with either the Trident submarines or the Tornado as the main bearer of its nuclear deterrent. Although the UK proceeded with Triant, Tried it. Several Tornado squadrons based in Germany were assigned to Sauser, uh, that's Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, to deter a major Soviet offensive with both conventional and nuclear weapons, namely the WE-177 nuclear bomb, which was retired in 1998. German and Italian Tornadoes are capable of delivering USB-61 nuclear bombs, which are made available through NATO. Now, for the engine, British considered the selection of Rolls-Royce to develop the advanced engine for the MRCA to be essential and was strongly opposed to adopting an engine from an American manufacturer to the point where the UK might have withdrawn over the issue. In September 1969, Rolls-Royce's RB199 engine was selected to power the MRCA. One advantage over the US competition was that a technology transfer program between the partner nations had been agreed. The engine was to be developed and manufactured by a joint company, Turbo Union. The program was delayed by Rolls-Royce's entry into receivership in 1971. However, the nature of the multinational collaboration process helped avoid major disruption of the Tornado program. 
Research from the Supersonic Airliner Concord contributed to the development and final design of the RB199 and of the engine control units. They operate efficiently across a wide range of conditions and speeds of up to Mach 2 of the RB199 and several other engines make use of variable intake ramps to control the airflow. The hydraulic system is pressurized by siphoning power from both or either operational engine. The hydraulics are completely contained within the airframe rather than integrated with the engine to improve safety and maintainability. In the case of double engine or double generator failure, the Tornado has a single use battery capable of operating the fuel pump and hydraulics for up to 13 minutes. Relatively rare among fighter aircraft, the RB199 is fitted with thrust reversers to decrease the distance required to land safely. To fully deploy the thrust reverser during landings, the yaw damper is connected to the steering of the nose wheel to provide greater stability. In August 1974, the first RB199 powered flight of a prototype tornado occurred and the engine completed its qualification test in late 1978. The final production standard engine met both reliability and performance standards, though the development costs had been higher than predicted, in part due to the ambitious performance requirements. At the time of the tornado's introduction to service, the turbine blades of the engine suffered from a shorter lifespan than desired, which was rectified by the impl implementation of design revisions upon early production engines. Several upgraded engines were developed and used on both the majority of the Tornado ADVs and Germany's Tornado ECRs. The DECU Digital Engine Control Unit is the current engine control unit for the RB199 engines preceding the analog MECU Main Engine Control Unit, which was also known as the Q. Being designed for low-level operations, the Tornado required modifications to perform in medium-level operations that the RAF adopted in the 1990s. The RAF's GR-1 fleet was extensively remanufactured as Tornado GR-4s. Upgrades in Tornado GR-4s include a forward-looking infrared, a wide-angle HUD, improved cockpit displays, MVG capabilities, new avionics, and a GPS receiver. The upgrade eased the integration of new weapons and sensors which were purchased in parallel, including Oh, it must be the other guy who took off and went around. Uh, including the Storm Shadow Cruise Missile, the Brimstone Anti-Tank Missile, Paveway 3 Laser Guided Bombs, and the Raptor Reconnaissance Pod. The first flight of the Tornado GR-4 was on the 4th of April, 1997. The RAF accepted its first delivery on the 31st of October, 1997, and deliveries were completed in 2003. In 2005, the Royal Saudi Air Force opted to have their Tornado IDSs undergo a series of upgrades to become equivalent to the RAF's GR-4 configuration. On 21st of December 2007, Bay signed a £210 million contract for COTS, the Capability Upgrade Strategy pilot. This project would see RAF GR-4 and 4A improved in two phases, starting with the integration of the Payway 4 bomb and a communications upgrade, followed by a new tactical data link in Phase B. Beginning in 2000, German IDS and ECR Tornadoes received the ASTA-1 Avionic System Software Tornado and ADA upgrade. ASTA-1 involved a replacement weapons computer, new GPS, and laser inertial navigation systems. The new computer allowed the integration of the HARM-3, HARM-0, Block-4, and 5, and Taurus KEPD-350 missiles, the Rafael Lightning-2 laser designator pod, and the GBU-24 Paveway-3 laser guided bombs. The ASTA-2 upgrade began in 2005, primarily consisting of new digital avionic systems and a new ECM suite. These got upgrades are to be only applied to 85 Tornadoes, 20 ECRs, and 65 IDSs, as the Tornado is being replaced in part by the Eurofighter Typhoon. The ASTA-3 upgrade program, started in 2008, will introduce support for the laser-targeted joint direct attack munition along with further software changes. In January of 2016, the Build newspaper revealed that the newest upgrade of the ASTA suite to version 3.1, which includes color multifunctional LCD screens in place of monochrome CRT displays, is interfering with helmet-mounted night vision optical displays worn by pilots, rendering German tornado bombers deployed to Syria useless for night missions. The Defense Ministry admitted that bright cockpit lights could be a distraction for pilots and disclosed that the solution would be implemented in a few weeks but denied the need to fly night missions in Syria. The systems announced that in December of 2013, it had test flown a tornado equipped with parts that were made with 3D printing equipment. 
parts include a protective cover for the radio, landing gear guard, and air intake door support struts. Has demonstrated the feasibility of making replacement parts quickly and cheaply at the air base hosting the tornado. The company claimed that with some of the parts costing less than 100 pounds per piece to manufacture, 3D printing already resulted in savings of more than 300,000 pounds and would offer further potential cost savings of more than 1.2 million pounds through 2017. As far as the operational history of the aircraft goes with the Luftwaffe, the first tornado prototype made its first flight on the 14th of August 1974 from Ingolstadt Manching Airport in what was then West Germany. Deliveries of production tornadoes began on the 27th of July in 1979. The total number of tornadoes delivered to the German Air Force number 247, including 35 ECR variants. Originally, tornadoes equipped five fighter bomber wings, Geschweider, with one tactical conversion unit and four frontline wings, replacing the Lockheed F 104 Starfighter. When one of the two tornado wings of the German Navy was disbanded in 1994, its aircraft were used to re equip. A Luftwaffe's reconnaissance wing formerly equipped with RF-4E Phantoms. Fourteen German tornadoes undertook combat operations as part of NATO's campaign during the Bosnian War. Tornadoes operating from Piacenza, Italy, flew reconnaissance missions to survey damage inflicted by previous strikes and to scout targets for other aircraft to strike. These reconnaissance missions were reportedly responsible for a significant improvement in target selections throughout the campaign. In 1999, German Tornadoes participated in Operation Allied Force, NATO's military operation against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia during the Kosovo War. This was Ger Germany's first offensive air mission since World War II. The ECR aircraft would escort various Allies aircraft with carrying several AGM-88R missiles, counter-attempted use of radar against the Allied aircraft. During the Kosovo hostilities, Germany's IDS Tornadoes would routinely conduct reconnaissance flights to identify both ground enemy ground forces, and civilian refugees within Yugoslavia. The German tornadoes flew 2,108 hours and 446 sorties, firing 236 harm missiles at hostile targets. In June of 2007, uh, a pair of Luftwaffe tornadoes flew reconnaissance missions over an anti-globalization demonstration during the 33rd G8 summit in Heligende. Following the mission, the German Defense Ministry Admitted one aircraft had broken the minimum flying altitude and that mistakes were made in the handling of security of the summit. In 2007, the detachment of six tornadoes of the Aufklarungsgeschwader 51 Memelin 51st Reconnaissance Wing were deployed to Mazar e Sharif, northern Afghanistan, to support NATO forces. The decision to send tornadoes to Afghanistan was controversial. One political party launched an unsuccessful legal bid to block the deployment as unconstitutional. In support of the Afghanistan mission, improvements in the tornado's reconnaissance equipment were accelerated, enhancing the tornado's ability to detect hidden improvised explosive devices. The German tornadoes were withdrawn from Afghanistan in November of 2010. Defense cuts announced in March 2003 resulted in the decision to retire 90 tornadoes from service with the Luftwaffe. This led to a reduction in its tornado strength to four wings by this September of 2005. On the 13th of January 2004, the then German Defense Minister Peter Stuck. Is he taking off? He is taking off. Why are you taking off? You're taking off too? I ordered you to bug out. Bug out! Bug out! Bug out! Bug out! Bug out! Bug out! Ah, whatever. They'll die. Bug out! Announced further major changes to the German Armed Forces. Major part of this announcement is the plan to cut the German fighter fleet from 426 in early 2004 to 265 by 2015. The German Tornado Force is to be reduced to 85, with the type expected to remain in service with the Luftwaffe until 2025. Well, that's your own fault. The aircraft being retained have been undergoing a service life extension program. Currently, the Luftwaffe operates tornadoes with tactical wings. Tactisches Luftwaffengeschwader 33 in Kokum, Neutral Air Base, Rhineland Palatine, and with Tactische Luftwaffengeschwader 51 in Memelin and Jagel, Schweizlich Postan. 
Oh, I didn't know I was that close to a tornado thing. So I was uh, studying over there. German tornado aircrew training took place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, U.S. from January 1996. At the time, at that time, was called the Taktische Ausbildungskommando der Luftwaffe USA. Technical Training Command of the Luftwaffe USA was responsible for training both German F-4 Phantom and Tornado crews. In 1999, the training command was renamed as Fliegerisches Ausbildungszentrum der Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe Training Center. In March 2015, Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen decided to continue this training in Germany. In September 2017, flight training in Holloman for the tornado was discontinued and transferred to Taktischen Luftwaffen Eschwader 51 in Iago with the U.S. location command dissolved in 2019. In April, wait, when was that decision made? 2015, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. In April of 2020, Germany announced its replacement for its tornado aircraft will be a split purchase of 30 Super Hornets, 15 Growlers, and 55 Eurofighter Typhoons. The Super Hornet was selected due to its compatibility with nuclear weapons and the availability of an electronic attack version. As of March 2020, the Super Hornet is not certified for the B-61 nuclear bombs, but Dan Gillian, head of Boeing's Super Hornet program, previously stated that we certainly think that we, working with the U.S. government, can meet the German requirements there on the German's combine. That's interesting. I would have thought for sure they'd be certified with the B-61. But... Then you have uh, their service with the German Navy, Marineflieger. In addition to the order made by the Luftwaffe, the German Navy's Marineflieger also received 112 of the IDS variant in the anti shipping and marine reconnaissance roles, again replacing the Starfighter. These equipped two wings, each with a nominal strength of 48 aircraft. The principal anti ship weapon was the AS 34 Cormoran anti ship missile, which were initially supplemented by unguided bombs and BL 755 cluster munitions and later by AGM-88 Harm anti-radar missiles. Pods fitted with panoramic optical cameras and infrared line scan were carried for the reconnaissance mission. The end of the Cold War and the signing of the CFE Treaty gave rise to a requirement for Germany to reduce the size of its armed forces, including the number of combat aircraft. To meet this need, one of the Marine Flieger's tornado wings was disbanded on the 1st of January 1994, and I'm sorry, did he just... <laughs> I was looking away, did he crash or did he just explode on the uh, taxiway there? Oh, well, I think that's our wingman for now then. Because they were stupid. To meet this need, uh -huh. one of the Marine oh, Fleegers... One of the Marine Fleegers tornado wings was suspended on the 1st of January 1994. Its aircraft replaced the Phantoms of the Luftwaffe Reconnaissance Wing. The second wing was enlarged and continued in the anti-shipping reconnaissance and anti-radar roles until it was disbanded in 2005 with its aircraft and duties passed on to the Luftwaffe. Now we get into the Italian Air Force, also known as the Aeronautica Militare. The first Italian prototype made its maiden flight on the 5th of December 1975 from Turin, Italy. Aeronautica Militare received a total of 100 Tornado IDSs, known as the A200, in Italian service. 16 A200s were subsequently converted to the ECR configuration. The first Italian e Tornado ECR, known as the EA200, was delivered on the 27th of February 1998. As a stopgap measure for 10 years, the Aeronautica Militare Additionally operated 24 Tornado ADVs in the air defense role, which were released from the RAF to cover the service gap between the requirement of the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter and the introduction of the Eurofighter Typhoon. Italian Tornadoes, along with RAF Tornadoes, took part in the first Gulf War in 1991. Operation Locusta saw eight Tornado IDS interjectors deployed from Giola del Cor, Italy, to Al Dafara Abu Dhabi as part of Italy's contribution to the coalition. During the conflict, one aircraft was lost to Iraqi anti aircraft fire, but the pilots ejected safely. However, they were captured by Iraqi forces. A total of 22 Italian tornadoes were deployed in the NATO organized Al Operation Allied Force over Kosovo in 1999, and 
the A200 served in the bombing role while the E-A200 patrolled the combat region acting to suppress enemy air anti-aircraft radars firing 115 AGM-88 harm missiles. In 2000, with major delays hampering the Eurofighter, the Aeronautica Militare began a search for another interim fighter. While the tornado itself was considered, any long-term extension to the lease would have involved upgrading to the RAF CSB standard and thus was not considered cost-effective. In February of 2001, Italy announced its arrangement to lease 35 S-16s from the United States under the Peace Caesar program. The Aeronautica Militare returned its Tornado ADVs to the RAF with the final aircraft arriving at RAF St. Athen on 7th of December 2004. One aircraft was retained for static display purposes at the Italian Air Force Museum. In July of 2002, Italy signed a contract with the Tornado Management Agency and Panavia for the upgrading of 18 A200s, the first of which was received in 2003. The upgrade in introduced improved navigation systems and the ability to carry new weapons including a Storm Shadow cruise missile, joint direct attack munition, and Paveway 3 laser guided bombs. In response to the anticipated violence during the 2010 Afghanistan elections, Italy along with several other nations increased its military commitment in Afghanistan, dispatching four A200 tornadoes to the region. Italy has opted to extend the tornado service life at the expense of alternative ground attack aircraft such as the AMX International AMX. In 2010, a major upgrade in life extension program was initiated to provide new digital displays, Link 16 communications capability, night vision goggles capability, and several other upgrades. In the long term, it is planned to replace the Tornado IDS ECR fleet in Italian service with the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II, with the final Italian tornado scheduled to be phased out in 2025. The Aeronautica Militare received its first of an, of an eventual 15 upgraded Tornado EA-200s on the 15th of June 2013. Italian Tornado A-200 and EA-200 aircraft participated in the enforcement of a UN no-fly zone during the 2011 military intervention in Libya. Various coalition aircraft operated from bases in Italy, including RAF tornadoes. Italian military aircraft delivered combined 710 guided bombs and missiles during the strikes against Libyan targets. Of these, Aeronautica Militari Tornadoes and AMX Fighter Bombers released 550 guided bombs and missiles, and Italian Navy AV-8Bs delivered 160 guided bombs. Italian Tornadoes launched 20 to 30 Storm Shadow cruise missiles, with the rest consisting of Payway and JDAM guided bombs. On the 19th of August 2014, two Aeronautica Militari Tornadoes collided in midair during a training mission near Escoli. On the 14th of November 2014, Italy announced it was sending four tornado aircraft with 135 support staff to Ahmad Al Jabbar Air Base and two other bases in Kuwait in participation of coalition operations against the Islamic State. The four aircraft will be used for reconnaissance missions only. In October of 2018, it was announced that the EA 200 tornado had successfully completed operational testing of the AGM 88E AARGM providing capabilities of an expanded target set, counter shutdown capability, advanced signals processing for improved detection and locating, geographic specificity, and the weapon impact assessment broadcast capability. Now, on to, oh, knocked my glasses off there. On to the Royal Air Force. Nicknamed the Tonka by the British, their first prototype, XX-946, made its main flight on 30th October 1974 from BAC Wharton. First full production tornado GR1 ZA319 flew on the 10th of July 1979 from Wharton. First RAF tornado ZA320 and ZA322 were delivered to the TTTE at RAF Cottesmore on the 1st of July 1980. Crew that qualified from the Blitz, the Trinational Tornado Training Organization. Uh, went on to the Tornado Weapons Conversion Unit, TWCU, which formed on the 1st of August 1981 at RAF Huntington before being posted to a Frontline Squadron. Number 9B Squadron became the first Frontline Squadron in the world to operate the Tornado when it reformed on the 1st of June 1982, having received its first Tornado GR1 ZA586 on the 6th of January 1982. No, number 9B Squadron was declared strike combat ready to the Supreme Allied Commander Europe in January 1983. 
Two more squadrons were formed at RAF Marham in 1983, number 617 squadron on the 1st of January and number 27 squadron on the 12th of August. The first RAF Tornado GR-1 loss was on the 27th of September 1983 when ZA-586 suffered complete electrical failure and crashed. Navigator Flight Lieutenant Nigel Nichols ejected while the pilot squadron leader Michael Stephens died in the crash after ordering ejection. In January of 1984, the TWCU adopted the guise of number 45 Reserve Squadron. RAF Germany began receiving tornadoes after the formation of 15 Squadron on the 1st of September 1983 at RAF Larbruch, followed by number 16 Squadron in January 1984 and both of these were originally Blackburn Buccaneer squadrons. They were then joined by number 20 squadron in May 1984, who at the time were operating the Sepicat Jake Ward GR-1 from RAF Bruggen. Unlike the Tornado squadrons based in the UK, which were under the control of the British military, those stationed in RAFG were under the control of the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, with the aircraft on Quick Reaction Alert Nuclear, or QRAN, being equipped with the WE-177 nuclear bomb. In the event of the Cold War going hot, the majority of RAF G-20 squadrons were tasked with destroying Warsaw Pact airfields and surface-to-air missile sites in East Germany. While number 20 squadron was given a separate responsibility of destroying bridges over the rivers Elbe and Laser to prevent Warsaw Pact forces from advancing. By early 1985, numbers 15, 16, and 20 squadrons at RAF Larbrooks had been declared strike combat ready to saucer. Tornadoes began to arrive at RAF Bruggen in September 1984 with the formation of number 31 squadron. Number 17 squadron was formed in December of 1984 with the two Brugger squadrons joined by number 14 designate squadron in mid-1985. Number 9B squadron relocated from RAF Huntington to RAF Bruggen on the 1st of October 1986, arriving in a Diamond 9 formation. The outcome of the Rajevic summit in, in October of 1986 between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev led to the end of QRAN for the, new, for the Tornado Force. By the end of 1986, the Tornado GR-1 fleet had been equipped with a laser ranger, rangefinder, and mark target seeker under the nose and had begun to be equipped with the B0Z-107 or BOZ-107 chaff and flare dispenser. The tornado made its combat debut as part of Operation Granby, the British contribution to the Gulf War in 1991. This saw 49 RAF Tornado GR1s deployed to Morak Airfield in Bahrain, Bahrain and to, uh, or sorry, Bahrain, um, and to Tabuk Air Base in the Haran Airfield in Saudi Arabia. 18 Tornado F3s were deployed to provide air cover, the threat of their long range missiles being a deterrent to Iraqi pilots who would deliberately avoid combat when approached. Early on in the conflict, the GR-1s targeted military airfields across Iraq, deploying a mixture of 450 kg un unguided bombs and loft bombing attacks and specialized JP-233 runway denial weapons. On the 27th, or sorry, on the 17th of January 1991, the first tornado to be lost was shot down by an Iraqi SA-16 missile following a failed low-level bombing run. On the 19th of January, another RAF tornado was shot down during an intensive raid on Halil Air Base. The impact of the tornado strikes upon Iraqi airfields is difficult to determine. A total of six RAF tornadoes were lost in the conflict, four were lost while delivering unguided bombs, and one was lost after delivering JP-223 and one trying to deliver laser-guided bombs. The UK sent out a detachment of Blackburn Buccaneer aircraft equipped with Westinghouse Electric Corporation a spike laser designators, allowing Tornado GR-1s to drop precision-guided weapons guided by the Buccaneers. Plan program to fit GR-1s with the GEC Macroni PL laser designation system was rapidly accelerated to give the Tornado Force the ability to self-designate targets. Author Klaus Christian Schnenden declared that the PL pod enabled the GR-1 to achieve probably the most accurate bombing in the RAF's history. Although well, laser designation proved effective in the Gulf War, only 23 TL pods had been purchased by 2000. Shortages hindered combat operations over Kosovo. After the war's opening phase, the GR-1 switched to medium-level strike missions. Typical targets include munitions depots and oil refineries. 
Only the Reconnaissance Tornado GR1s continued flying the low-level altitude high-speed profile, emerging unscathed despite the inherent danger in conducting pre-attack reconnaissance. After the conflict, Britain maintained a military presence in the Gulf. Round 6 GR1s were based at Ali Al Salim Air Base in Kuwait, contributing to the Southern No-Fly Zone as part of Operation Southern Watch. Six additional GR1s participated in Operation Provide Comfort over Northern Iraq. The upgraded Tornado GR4 made its operational debut in Operation Southern Watch, patrolling Iraq's southern airspace from bases in Kuwait. Both Tornado GR1s and GR4s based at Ali Al Salim, Kuwait, took battery took part in coalition strikes at Iraq's military infrastructure during Operation Desert Fox in 1998. In December of 1998, an Iraqi anti-aircraft battery fired 6 to 8 missiles at a patrolling tornado. The battery was later attacked in retaliation, and no aircraft were lost during the incident. It was reported that during Desert Fox, RAF tornadoes had successfully destroyed 75% of allotted targets, and out of 36 missions planned, 28 had been completed successfully. The GR-1 participated in the Kosovo War in 1999. Tornadoes initially operated from RAF Bruggen, Germany, and later moved to Solen Solenzara Air Base, Corsica. Experiences from Kosovo led to the RAF procuring AGM-65 Maverick missiles and enhanced paveway smart bombs for the tornado. Following the Kosovo War, the GR-1 was phased out as aircraft were upgraded to the GR-4 standard. The final upgrade was returned to the RAF on the 10th of June 2003. The GR-4 was used in Operation Telic, Britain's contribution to the 2003 invasion of Iraq. RAF tornadoes flew alongside American aircraft in the opening phase of the war, striking at Iraqi installations. Aiming to minimize civilian casualties, tornadoes employed, deployed the Storm Shadow cruise missile for the first time. And whilst 25% of the UK's air-launched weapons in Kosovo were precision-guided, four years later in Iraq, this ratio increased to 85%. On the 23rd of March 2003, a Tornado GR-4 was shot down over Iraq by friendly fire from a U.S. Patriot missile battery, killing both crew members. In July 2003, a U.S. Board of Inquiry exonerated the battery's operator, observing the Tornado's lack of functioning IFF as a factor in the incident. Problems with the Patriot were also suggested as a factor. Multiple incidents of misidentification friendly aircraft have occurred, including the fatal shootdown of a U.S. Navy F-A-18 a few weeks after the Tornado's loss. Britain withdrew the last of its tornadoes from Iraq in June of 2009. In early 2009, several GR-4s arrived at Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan, to replace the British Aerospace Harrier GR-79 aircraft, which had been deployed there since 2000, November 2004. In 2009, Paveway 4 guided bombs were brought into service on the RAS tornadoes, having been previously used in Afghanistan by the Harrier 2. In summer of 2010, extra tornadoes were dispatched to Kandahar for the duration of the 2010 Afghan election. British tornadoes ended operation in Afghanistan in November 2014, having flown over 5,000 pairs of sorties over 33,500 hours, including 600 shows of force to the Turk Taliban attacks. During more than 70 engagements, some 140 brimstone missiles and paveway forward bombs were deployed, and over 3,000 27mm cannon shells were fired. Prior to the 2010 Strategic Defense and Security Review's publication, the tornado's requirement was under consideration, with savings of 7.5 billion pounds anticipated. The SDSR announced the tornado would be retained at the expense of the Harrier II, although numbers would decline in the transition to the Eurofighter Typhoon and the F-35 Lightning II. By July of 2013, 59 RAF GR-4s were receiving the CUSP avionics upgrade, which achieved an initial service date of March of 2013. On the 18th of March 2011, British Prime Minister David Cameron announced that tornadoes and typhoons would enforce the no-fly zone in Libya. In March 2011, several tornadoes flew 3,000-mile strike missions against targets inside Libya that were, according to Defense Secretary Liam Fox, the longest-range bombing missions conducted by the RAF since the Falklands conflict. A variety of munitions were used during the tornado operations over Libya, including laser-guided bombs and brimstone missiles. In August 2014, Tornado GR-4s were deployed to RAF Akrotiri, Cyprus, to support refugees sheltering from Islamic State militants in the Mount Sinai region of Iraq. The decision came three days after the United States began conducting air attacks against the Islamic State. 
Grenadoes were pre-positioned to gather situational awareness in the region. On the 29th of September 2014, three days after Parliament approved airstrikes against Islamic State forces inside Iraq, two tornadoes conducted their first armed reconnaissance mission in conjun conjunction with coalition aircraft. Next day, two tornadoes made the first airstrike on a heavy weapons post in an armored vehicle supporting Kurdish forces in northwest Iraq. By the 1st of March 2015, eight RAF tornadoes have been deployed to Akrotiri and conducted 159 airstrikes against IS targets in Iraq. On the 2nd of December 2015, Parliament approved airstrikes in Syria as well as Iraq to combat the growing threat of ISIL. And the tornadoes actually began bombing ISIS later that evening. On the 14th of April 2018, Four tornado GR-4s launched from RAF Akrotiri struck a Syrian military facility with Storm Shadow cruise missiles in response to a suspected chemical attack on Douma by the Syrian regime the previous week. On the 10th of July 2018, nine tornado GR-4s from RAF Marham participated in a flypast over London to celebrate 100 years of the RAF. During late 2018, the RAF commemorated the tornado service with three special schemes, BG, 752 paid homage to its early years with a green-gray wraparound camouflage. DG-775 and CD-716 both wore schemes commemorating the final units operate the type. Number 9B Squadron and Number 31 Squadron, respectively. On the 1st of January 2019, the Tornado GR-4 flew its last operational sorties in Operation Shader. The eight tornadoes formerly stationed at RAF Akrotiri returned to RAF Marham in early February 9, 2019, their duties assumed by six typhoons. Between September 2014 and January 2019, RAF tornadoes accounted for 31% of the estimated 4,315 casualties inflicted upon Izzo by the RAF during the operation. To celebrate 40 years of service and to mark the type's retirement, several flypaths were carried out on the 19th, 20th, and 21st of February over locations such as Bay Wharton, RAF Huntington, and RAF Lossiemel. On the 28th of February, nine tornadoes flew out of RAF Marham for a Diamond 9 formation flypass over a graduation parade, parade at RAF Cranwell before returning and carrying out a series of passes over RAF Marham. On the 14th of August 2019, the final flight of an RAF tornado was carried out by Tornado GR4ZA463, the oldest remaining tornado, over RAF Marham during the disbandment parade of No. 9 Squadron and No. 31 Squadron. Tornado GR4 was officially retired from RAF service on the 1st of April 2019, the 101st anniversary of the force. Post retirement, five tornadoes returned to RAF Huntington via road for the complex air ground environment which simulates a tornado flight line for training purposes. And we're almost done. Just got, a, got the Royal Saudi Air Force history. I figured this would be somewhat quick to go through since, hey, only four countries, but the British just and the Germans just used their tornadoes so extensively. At least in comparison to the Italians who really only use them in Libya, more or less. Royal Saudi Air Force. On the 25th of September 1985, the UK and Saudi Arabia signed the Al Yama 1 contract, including, amongst other things, the sale of 48 IDS and 24 ADB model tornadoes. The first flight of a Royal Saudi Air Force tornado IDS was on the 26th of March 1986, and the first Saudi ADB was delivered on the 9th of February 1989. Saudi tornadoes undertook operations during the Gulf War. In June of 1993, the Al Yama 2 contract was signed, the main element of which were 48 additional IDSs. Following experience with both the Tornado McDonnell Douglas F 15E Strike Eagle, the Royal Saudi Air Force discontinued low level mission training in the F 15E in light of the Tornado's superior low altitude flight performance. In addition, 10 of the Saudi tornadoes were outfitted with equipment for performing reconnaissance missions. The 22 Tornado ADVs were replaced by the Eurofighter Typhoon. The retired aircraft were being purchased back by the UK. By 2007, both the Sea Eagle anti-ship missile and Alarm anti-radiation missile that previously equipped the RSAF's tornadoes have been withdrawn from service. As of 2010, Saudi Arabia has signed several contracts for new weapon systems to be fitted to their tornado and typhoon fleets such as the short-range air-to-air IRIS-T missile, as well as the Brimstone and Storm Shadow cruise missiles. 
In September of 2006, the Saudi government signed a contract worth 2.5 billion pounds with Bay Systems to upgrade up to 80 RSAF aircraft to keep them in service until 2020. The first RSAF tornado was returned to Bay Systems Wharton in 2006 for upgrade under the Tornado Sustainment Program to equip the IDS fleet with a range of new precision guided weapons and enhanced test targeting equipment, in many cases common with those already fielded by the UK's Tornado GR4s. In December of 2007, the first RSAF aircraft to complete modernization was returned to Saudi Arabia. Starting from the first week of November 2009, Saudi Air Force tornadoes, along with Saudi F-15s, performed air raids during the Shia insurgency in North Yemen. It was the first time since Operation Desert Storm in 1991 that the Royal Saudi Air Force participated in military operation over hostile territory. Saudi Air Force tornadoes are playing a central role in the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen. On the 7th of January 2018, Houthi fighters claimed to have shot down a Saudi warplane which was conducting air raids over northern Yemen. According to Saudi reports, down aircraft was a tornado of the Royal Saudi Air Force which was on a combat mission in the skies over Thada province in northern Yemen. Saudi reports said that it was lost for technical reasons and that both crew were rescued. In the night of the 14th of February 2020, a Saudi tornado was shot down during close air support mission in support of Saudi allied Yemeni forces in the Yemeni Al Uf government by Houthis. On the day after, the Saudi command confirmed the loss of a tornado, while video evidence was released showing the downing using a two stage surface to air missile. Both pilots ejected and were captured by the Houthis. And its service continues to be ongoing in the. Uh, in that Yemen conflict, and there were a lot of variants of the uh, <laughs> of the tornado, as you may have uh, noticed. So there's the GR1, which is the RAF IDS variants, um, and later modifications were designated the GR1A and the GR1B, the GR4 and GR4A. The first of 228 GR1s was delivered on the 5th of June 1979 and the type entered service in the early 1980s. Sorry. Then you had the Tornado GR1B, which was a specialized anti-shipping variant to the GR1, uh, designed to replace the Blackburn Buccaneer. 26 aircraft were converted and were based at RAF Lossiemouth, Scotland. Each aircraft was equipped to carry up to four Sea Eagle anti-ship missiles. First, the GR-1B lacked the radar capability to track shipping, instead relying on the missile seeker for target acquisition. Later updates allowed target data to be fed from the aircraft to the missile. Then you had the Tornado GR-4, which um, was a midlife upgrade for the GR-1 that was started in 1984 and finally approved in 1994, which was designed to improve the capability of medium altitude roles based on their performance in the Gulf War. British Aerospace upgraded 142 Tornado GR1s to the GR4 standard beginning in 1996 and finished in 2003. 59 RAF aircraft later received the Cusp Avionics package, which integrated the Paveway 4 bomb and installed a new secure communications module from Cassidian in Phase A, followed by the Tactical Information Exchange data link from General Dynamics in Phase B. Then you have the Tornado GR-1A and GR-4A, which were reconnaissance variants. The GR-1A was a recon variant operated by the RAF and RSAF, fitted with the Tornado Infrared Reconnaissance System, replacing the cannon. The RAF had 30 GR-1As, 14 as GR-1 rebuilds and 16 as new builds. And when they were upgraded to become GR-4s, the GR-1A were updated to the GR-4A standard. Switch from low level operations to medium and high level operations means that the internal tiers was no longer used, and as the GR4A's internal sensors are no longer essential, the RAF's tactical reconnaissance wing can operate both the GR4A and GR4 aircraft. I imagine by that point they had used more advanced potted reconnaissance systems. Then you have the Tornado ECR, which was operated by Germany and Italy. The ECR is a tornado variant devoted to suppression of enemy air defense missions. It was delivered on the 21st of May 1990 and it has sensors to detect radar usage and is equipped with anti radiation AGM 88 armed missiles. The Luftwaffe's 35 ECRs 
um, were delivered new, while Italy received 16 converted IDS variants. Uh, Italian ECRs differ from Luftwaffe aircraft as they lack built-in reconnaissance capability and use Riki light reconnaissance pods. Further, only Luftwaffe ECRs are equipped with the RB199 Mark 105 engine, which has a higher thrust rating. German ECRs do not carry a cannon. The RAF used the IDS version in the seed rule instead of the ECR and also modified several of its Tornado F3s to undertake that mission. So they functionally had an ECR, but they had their own version that they did with their own conversions rather than through the consortium. And then there was the Tornado ADV air defense variant, which was an interceptor variant that the Tornado developed for the RAF designated Tornado F2 or F3, and also operated by Saudi Arabia and Italy. The ADV had inferior agility to fighters like the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, but it was not intended as a dogfighter, but rather was a long endurance interceptor to counter the threat from Cold War bombers. Although the ADV had 80% parts commonality with the Tornado IDS, the ADV had a greater acceleration, improved RB199 Mark 104 engines, a stretch body, greater fuel capacity, the AI or AL-24 Fox Hunter radar and software changes. It had only one cannon to accommodate a retractable in-flight refueling probe. And currently, the Tornado continues to serve with the Army or with the Air Force of, um, of Germany, as well as the Italian Air Force. And the, uh, of course, the Saudi Air Force, but the UK has retired the type in favor of the Eurofighter Typhoon and the F 35. And, um, that about does it. <laughs> that is the fairly not brief history of the tornado. So now we will go to our debrief screen. Mission success! You have successfully completed this quick mission. We destroyed all 18 targets, we took 20% damage from ground base AAA, and all our wingmen are dead because they either got hit... One got hit by any air-to-air -air missiles, one got hit by a SAM missile, I think, and then the other two were just stupid. So we destroyed one helicopter, one SAM, two AAAs, three vehicles, six structures, and 13 others. Wingman 1 uh, did nothing, apparently. I think he was the first one that got shot down, though. Uh, we had one air-to-air -air missile launch, which hit. That was our sidewinder on that flanker that one of the Eurofighters finished off. And then we have a 24% hit on our gun and 68% hit on our bomb. Because I think that last bomb missed a bit. Uh, there were no air-to-air -air missile launches on us. Uh, oh, where did he get... Okay, so that wingman got hit by SAM launches. No? No, he was one of the stupid ones that crashed, I think. Because, yeah, the one air-to-air -air missile launch failed, and all four SAM launches were spoofed. There were 12 SAM launches on us, one failed, one was jammed, the rest were spoofed. And there were, uh, the AA uh, that was shooting at us, 23% of their shots managed to hit us. So I guess they didn't fire too many shots at us. And none at our wingman. So that is the Tornado. Um, Friday will be uh, going through the... Sepakat Jaguar, which is another, uh, which is actually an Anglo-French aircraft that managed to make it to completion. I know, big surprise that France didn't pull out of that one, but uh, we'll be going over that. And then there might be one or two more aircraft I can dig up that could theoretically have been used in the Baltic campaign. But after that, I think we'll be moving on to the rest of the single mission. So with that, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there. And we'll see you then.